Nigeria records 404 new COVID-19 cases, pushing totals past 42,000. Examination dates set for NECO, NCEE and NABTEB. In international news, China says closure of U.S. consulate in Chengdu legitimate and necessary. This is ANN News. We do apologize for the audio issue. Nigeria is now nursing 42,208 cases of coronavirus infections after the country's Center for Disease Control, NCDC, reported 404 new cases on Wednesday. The new cases represent the lowest daily record for this month. July started with a high number of 790 cases. The lowest figure before now was five days ago when 435 cases were confirmed. The number of deaths rose to 8,073 after five new fatalities were reported on Wednesday. Just about half of the total cases still have the virus, while 19,004 have recovered. The infections are spread among 35 states and the federal capital territory. And CDC says Wednesday's new cases were reported in 19 states, with Lagos booking the highest number of 106, followed by the Federal Capital Territory at 54. And CDC has advised Nigerians to adhere to established COVID-19 protocols of wearing face masks, maintaining physical distancing and embracing proper hygiene as they prepare for summer festivities that begin today, Thursday. The center also urged the elderly and Nigerians with underlying health conditions to be more cautious so they wouldn't risk contracting the virus. Four out of the 50 persons arrested at an alluring nightclub nearly two weeks ago by the Quara Technical Committee on COVID-19 have tested positive for the coronavirus. Chairman of the state's Medical Advisory Committee on COVID-19, Dr. Femi Oladiji, told the news agency on, of Nigeria in Illawarra on Wednesday. The infected persons have been contacted but had not been taken to isolation centers. He said one people are told about their test results. They cannot be forced to report to authorities. He said many people are carriers that have been going about their normal lives because they are asymptomatic. He said many quarrels do not know they have the virus. Dr. Ladiji says the best thing at its stage is preventive measures because of the rampant spread of the virus. It says those with symptoms should visit the isolation centers, but those without symptoms should self-isolate. Dates are now set for the Senior Secondary School Certificate Examinations, SSCE, National Common Entrance Examination, and NCEE, and National Business and Technical Examination Board, NAPTEP. 
The National Examination Council, NECO, says SSE examinations will start on Monday, October the 5th and run through November the 18th. National Common Entrance Examinations will take place later that month on October the 17th. The National Business and Technical Examinations Board exams will start on September the 21st. Minister of State for Education, Emekan Wajoba, announced the examination dates at the end of a two-day meeting with chief executives of examination bodies. The ongoing NECO SSCE registration will end on September the 10th. The Lagos Ibada Standard Gauge uh, Railway project started in 2012. The Chinese funded construction was to have ended in April this year, but COVID 19 intruded and slowed the work. The engineering company working on the rail project is now working to set another completion date. And correspondent David Badmos reports. Of the Lagos Ibadan Railway project was awarded in 2012 and scheduled for completion in just three years. But bureaucratic and funding delays mean the project is still under construction eight years after it was awarded. The government had announced the project was going to be completed in April, but the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic changed everything. Even the locomotive and coaches that are brought in, we could not uh, organize the, the commissioning and training. So we, we, we cannot be in hurry and uh, endanger our workers' lives. Even though no new completion date has been given, but the government and the Chinese firm handling the project say the Lagos Ibadan Standard Gauge Rail Line will become operational by the end of the year. About 80% of imports into Nigeria actually come from the ports in this city. And the only means of moving these imports to other parts of the country is by road. And that's the reason why hundreds of trucks flood this city every day to pick up goods, thereby causing pollution and traffic congestion in the process but when the rail line eventually becomes operational most of the goods from the ports will be ferried by rail thereby saving the city and the country the huge cost of ferrying goods by road and causing traffic congestion and pollution in the process if we are able to complete it to the port and shippers can now load directly to the rail i think it will affect the economy of Nigeria and the commerce of Nigeria. And most times the companies say they are waiting for raw material and spare parts. We we'll get them delivered to time. And at the same time, what we are exporting can go to the port through the rail. Travel to the city of Ibadan from Lagos is now by road and from this rowdy bus pack. Traveling from here is stressful for most passengers and still doesn't come cheap. Besides, the journey time could take up to three hours. But when the train becomes operational, that journey time would be cut by more than half. Some passengers say they can't wait. Somebody should live at Shagamu and be able to work in Lagos. Somebody to be able to live at Igebode or in Dambekuta and work in Lagos and work in VI if the train system is effective. What will happen is that if this is planned well, it could become a, con a continuous development corridor. So not just a transport corridor, the development corridor because what you find is that you will dot the whole all the capital cities in the trajectory would have industrial parks many people are looking forward to the commencement of the standard gauge rail service when that happens it could lead to decongestion in the city coming up african news south africa sees rapid rise in covid 19 cases and later, international news. China says closure of U.S. consulate in Chengdu legitimate and necessary. You are watching ANN. See you tomorrow, Papa. I am happy and I know I'm free. Now, not time for meeting. Any landlord when you should pay fine. We can go call her. Eh? House number one. Present. Papa, they don't disturb me to you. House number five. And they're angry that you're not here. Just put me on the window there so that I can see them and I can hear them. He's not around, so his house is sanctioned. Present. Present.
I carry data for head, I carry them for back. Correct data, I know the payment. Say, I know the nomi, say, I know the Sioka landlord. Talk to me face to face. Explore without limits. Turn it up on MTN, the reliable data network. Driver, fire ahead. <laughs> Welcome back. This is in News. South Africa is experiencing rapid increase in COVID-19 cases. The tally now stands at more than 470,000 cases. The country's healthcare system is struggling under the weight of these rapidly rising infections as the country leads the rest of Africa in coronavirus infections. And correspondent Dimitra Undu has the story. Since the government eased lockdown restrictions in June, there's been a steady rise in new infections. We started off well with the, with the lockdown. We started by closing the schools. I think we did everything right. Um, however, as we opened things up, it, things got a little more complicated. I think our biggest crisis right now is that half the problem is that we are not taking it seriously now. Our lockdown has helped to reduce the spread of, of the virus. Reducing the spread does not mean that the virus will not be there. I think in our opening up and sort of like reducing the restrictions, that is where we somewhat, I can't say failed because that is really a wrong word to say, but we somehow overlooked that there was a possibility of community spread. South Africa was praised for its swift lockdown. But now there's concerns the country's high infection rate will spread to the rest of Africa. South Africa also has a very different situation from countries like in Europe, for instance. Our reality is that the majority of places, um, the majority of citizens of the country are poor and they live in environments where social distancing, at least at home, is impossible and in places where running water often isn't available. The rapid rise in infections prompted the president to ban alcohol sales for a second time and order all public schools to close for the next four weeks. It takes one person, technically, can spread the infection to two, between two and two, two and three people. So we're talking about the infection rate, the, R, the reproductive rate, about two and a half. So in one person, if that person doesn't get sick or doesn't get tested, in 30 days, by spreading it out like that, one person can be responsible for almost 400 infections. Unfortunately, we're also dealing with COVID-related stigma and testing backlogs, which means that many people infected with the coronavirus don't end up in quarantine facilities in time because they get back their test, relates, uh, their test results too late, or they are reluctant to go because of stigma or poverty. South Africa is now firmly in the eye of the storm. The peak is expected by September. Ugandan car importers are feeling the COVID-19 pinch as the virus has affected their business. Many car dealers in the country say they are weathering a financial storm that can only get worse if COVID-19 hangs around much longer. Respondent Hilary Ayasiga reports. Simon Mugayo is a second-hand car importer in Uganda. He runs a car market in Naguru, a suburb in the capital Kampala. But he's concerned about the decline in his business. On average, we are expecting uh, an inflow of about 150 units to the car bond. <laughs> but during COVID, uh, it came down to around uh, between 30 and uh, 50. <laughs> so that's almost uh, cutting it down to about 30%. Mugayo says it is costing him a lot just to keep his business afloat. So he's now diversifying to offer more services at the car market. We have introduced a car service as uh, another way of trying to boost our income and uh, maybe to diversify in case um, there's COVID. And along with that, um, we had also planned a restaurant which we have now opened. Figures from Uganda's tax body show that only 700 cars were imported in the month of April against a monthly average import of 3,000 cars before COVID-19. Most of these cars were imported before the outbreak of COVID-19. Car importers say they are struggling to offload their stock because there aren't enough buyers. Car dealers now want the local authorities to reduce import duties because of the impact of COVID-19. 
Our businesses have been crippled by the pandemic. We want the government to reduce taxes so that we can resume business. But the country's taxman says they've already responded to their plight. All taxpayers who had uh, outstanding penalties and fines as at 30th June 2020 were forgiven. So in other words, and I can tell you that the penalty and the fine is a huge liability on the taxpayers. Uganda imports most of its second-hand cars from Asia. And as major exporting countries begin to ease restrictions, importers like Mugayo hope business will return to normal. When we return, international news. China says closure of U.S. consulate in Chengdu legitimate and necessary. And later, sport. Saka faces tough choice between England and Nigeria. You are watching ANN. We are on the road every day, canvassing throughout Africa for news you really need. We follow this story everywhere, from every corner of Nigeria to the wide African expanse. We bring you what's making headlines, we connect you with news you can use. ANN, African News Network, in a truly African spirit. Welcome back, this is ANN News. A new study by British researchers has indicated COVID-19 could lead to a wave of brain damage and neurological complications including stroke and nerve damage in infected patients. This is brain tissue from a man who died from COVID-19. Scientists are now testing to find out more about the growing link between coronavirus and brain disease. What we see is that antibodies are mounted against these, this white matter. Dr. Benedict Michael is leading a study tracking hundreds of patients who've suffered from neurological problems after contracting the virus. What we really need to understand now, we have some sense of the scale of the problem is, to what extent is this because the virus is directly infecting the brain? Or to what extent is it actually the virus is never in the brain, but it kicks off an immune response that then in turn uh, activates the brain and causes this inflammation. Dr. Michael is also looking into a condition called acute disseminated encephalitis, or ADAM, which leaves COVID-19 patients suffering from symptoms including confusion, weakness and nausea. What's been really interesting with COVID-19 is that we've seen a whole spectrum of neurological disorders. So we've seen those diseases you typically think of as neurological, like brain swelling, that's called encephalitis medically. And we've also seen an awful lot of strokes, many of which are recurring in patients without any risk factors for strokes. But even through that, we're seeing patients with presentations which we normally think of as psychiatric, like psychosis and catatonia. 73-year-old yeah. Linda Williams believes she suffered from frightening hallucinations while in hospital with COVID-19. Terribly scary. Terribly scary. Linda is home again, but more than three months later is still confused, weak and struggles with memory. Terrible. I wish I didn't have it. I wouldn't give it to let anyone get it if I could. It's a terrible thing to have. And now so many people have been infected that Dr. Reese Thomas says it's become easier to study the long-term impact of coronavirus on the brain. We know from the surveillance study and from speaking to other people that there's a proportion of people who got really sick but didn't go to hospital, who recovered at home and are still not back to work. And some of that is fatigue, but some is more than that. It's confusion, it's changing their thinking, it's changing their, perhaps the type of thinking that's involved with planning. And uh, sometimes it's more long, uh, long standing than that. It can go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. They call it the long tail of COVID. And this is what the long tail looks like in a brain scan. But this large white area here and here, you can see it's affecting both sides is where there's inflammation of the brain. Not just that, it's areas where the brain is dying and undergoing what we call necrosis. And that's the problem. People who develop brain complications from COVID-19 are often the most severely affected. Because once injured, the brain has only a limited capacity to restore itself. China's foreign ministry says the closure of U.S. consulate in Chengdu is legitimate and necessary. 
The action was taken in response to U.S. closure of China's consulate in Houston and the forced entry of American officials into their diplomatic premises. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi says the U.S. should be blamed for current difficulties in bilateral relations. China on Monday took over the premises of the U.S. consulate in the southwestern city of Chengdu, one of five the U.S. has on the Chinese mainland. It ordered the facility be vacated in retaliation for being ousted last week from the Chinese consulate in Houston. Now, Beijing is urging Washington to revoke what it calls its erroneous decision. China's request for the U.S. to close its Chengdu consulate and oversee the premises is a legitimate and necessary response to the unreasonable U.S. closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston and their forced entry to the premises. Our response complies with international law and diplomatic practice. The current situation between China and the United States is something we do not want to see. The responsibility lies entirely with the U.S. side. We once again urge the United States to immediately correct its mistakes and create necessary conditions for bilateral relations to go back to normal. Colombia is well known for its agricultural exports, both legitimate and extra legal. Coffee and cocoa are the two best known products that identify the South American nation. Despite this reputation as a provider of bulk commodities and controlled substances, Colombia's agricultural sector is urging consumers to support local farming. And correspondent Michel Big has the story. Bogota held its first Mercaton Campesino, or online farmer's market, to encourage citizens to buy locally and directly from farmers, rejecting middlemen who seek to mislead and profit from consumers. This pandemic has given us a lot of challenges to protect life, but also to produce differently, sell and consume differently. And this farmer's market shows how we took a problem and made it an opportunity. Mayor Lopez says farmers have suffered the most during the pandemic because of low prices and outbreaks in food distribution centers. Families who want to buy through the online food market can purchase a $27 box filled with fruits and vegetables. Supporting the farmers directly means families are also paying 10% less than what it would cost at the supermarket. We have been affected because of logistical difficulties with laborers and moving produce. Also, families are spending less, so the demand is down. Officials say 18,700 bundles of food were pre-ordered by citizens and delivered directly to their homes on July 25th through the 26th. The farmer's market claimed it would increase the producer's sale price by 155 percent. This has offered us a space to improve our income for our families and get a better price for our produce and give families excellent food quality. City officials say 500 farmers near Bogota participated in the online farmers market. So far, there are no plans for a second event, but farmers hope this will encourage more families to buy local produce. You are watching ANN. Whether in your house, at your office, on your phone or online, we are there. We have the facts behind the headlines. We cut to the chase with the news you really need. We cover every angle. We are the bigger, better news network. We are African News Network. ANN. Watch ANN News on MITV from a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News in sport. Arsenal young star Bukayo Saka has admitted it will be a difficult. Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal have been listed as confirmed entries for the Cincinnati warm-up event, a huge boost for the upcoming U.S. Open. 
for the land champions who have entered the ATP Masters 1000 event also include the top two players in the ATP rankings, world number one Djokovic with number two Nadal along with Grigor Dimitrov and Marin Kilic. The women's fields also include five Grand Slam champions Serena Williams, Gavin Muguruza, Sofia Kenin, Petra Kvitova and Slelava Kustasova, the 2019 runner-up in Cincinnati. That is in the news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, ANNAfrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at ANNAfrica TV. I am Olajimokyo Latunji. Have a pleasant evening.